Good afternoon. It is uh, lovely to see you this afternoon. Very warm welcome to Kirkentelic Baptist Church uh, for this Whitley lecture today. Um, I'm going to start fairly promptly, but I just wanted to say before we do, first of all, uh, a welcome to you all. I'm so glad that you've been able to come in to, to share in this occasion. I wanted to say a word of thanks as well to uh, David Gordon and the ministry team here and Maureen and her staff uh, who've helped us to put on this day um, and have helped organise with some of my own staff from the college, the catering and things. So uh, a really big thank you to, um, to all of the folks here at, uh, at Kirky Baptist and for allowing us to use uh, these lovely facilities as well. Um, we're putting on the occasion uh, also in conjunction with the Baptist Union of Scotland, so we appreciate their partnership in this day uh, as well. So over the, over the years, um, Scotland has tried to support the Whitley Lecture in any way that we can, and, um, and there's a number of our own folks in Scotland at this present time, notably Steve Holmes and, uh, and Andrew Rollinson, who in times past have been the Whitley Lecturers, and, uh, and so this is always a good occasion for us to engage with theological and biblical uh, concerns that matter to us. This year, the Whitley Lecture is being given by Helen Painter, who is a lecturer uh, at Bristol Baptist College and a minister part-time at Victoria Park Baptist Church in Bristol. So you're very, very welcome, Helen. Glad to have you with us. Uh, Helen began her working life in medicine where she was a nephrologist. Uh, so I had to Google that, but, uh, you know. <laughs> Thank the Lord for, for Google. Uh, so that, that was a kidney doctor, apparently. Um, not only a doctor of medicine, but also a doctor of theology. Her academic work has focused on the Old Testament, and particularly the narratives of the Old Testament. Her PhD was on aspects of humor, in the book of Kings. You didn't know there was any humor in Kings, did you? But, but Helen, Helen found it, and uh, it's in her book. Uh, but anyway, since that was no laughing matter, uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> She's now moved on to other parts of the Old Testament and other narratives to do with violence. Her master's dissertation was on total annihilation in Deuteronomy and Joshua. And her current research interest is in the violence uh, in the book of Judges. And just to fill out uh, your awareness of Helen's academic achievements, she also has a master's in missional church leadership. Helen, uh, we know, is passionate uh, in helping people to get to grips with the Bible and runs even small Bible classes in her own church uh, in order to enable people to engage with God's word, believing in the power that that has to transform lives. And so we're delighted that she's able to come and speak today on this subject, Dead and Buried, Attending to the Voices of the Victim in the Old Testament and Today. The lecture is in, also in book form, which is published by uh, the Whitley Group, or the Whitley Committee, and there's a number of copies on the table at the side over there, and the cost of this is five pounds to cover the cost of printing, and so if you would like a copy uh, of the lecture to study at your leisure, then please take one and pop the money into the sweetie box uh, at the back. It's also on Amazon and can be downloaded to Kindle. Uh, so, yes. So you can also purchase it from Amazon if that is your preference. Helen lives in Bristol, and that's where she's come from this morning, leaving very, very early uh, this morning. And I have to get her back to the airport uh, for a six o'clock flight tonight. So the running order basically is that Helen's going to speak for about an hour. Then we'll have about half an hour for questions, uh, which we'll field from the front. But if we'll pass a microphone amongst us, because this is being recorded for posterity. Uh, but we will finish fairly promptly at half past three so that um, Helen can get away. But we're delighted that uh, Helen's made the journey and I ask you to give her a welcome as she comes to speak to us just now. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much, Ian, and thank you very much to the college for your warm welcome and to the church. Um, add my thanks as well for your warm hospitality and uh, the Scottish Baptist Association as well. So it's lovely to be up here with you. Um, we love uh, Scotland as, as a family and uh, always love to come and visit here. Well, I must admit we often drive a little further north. <laughs> Um, and with regard to humour in the Book of Kings, there's actually a lot more violence with regard to that humour than you might imagine. So they weren't quite such different subjects as, as you might initially think. Let me tell you a story about why um, this subject matters to me or what began my interest in it. Um, the story is from about um, probably about 11, 12 years ago now, before I was in uh, ministry, before I'd done any theological training. And I got a phone call one day from um, the lady who ran our youth group at the church I was attending. And she phoned, and I don't know why she phoned me. I suspect she was working her way down the church list and got as far as P. Um, and she phoned me and said, Helen, um, one of the young people has been reading her Old Testament and has been reading some very disturbing stories and is in danger of losing her faith. What do I say to her? And I'm absolutely sure that nothing that I said that day was of any use at all. Um, but the, sto the question didn't uh, go away for me, and, and hence my ongoing um, thinking about the subject. So that's my starting point, I suppose. Let me. So the Old Testament has many gruesome and violent narratives. What are we supposed to make of them? Are we always supposed to approve of them? To enjoy them? Are we supposed to see them as a negative example? Or should we perhaps ignore them altogether? How do we read the Old Testament texts of violence? And in particular, how do we read them ethically? I'm very disturbed by the use to which the Old Testament texts of violence have been put over the years. Let's consider the case of the Amalekites. They were the archetypal enemies of the people of Israel, and they were to be entirely obliterated according to several texts in the Old Testament. Here's one from the book of Deuteronomy. I'll read it to you. Remember what Amalek did to you on your journey out of Egypt, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and struck down all who lagged behind you. He did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies on every hand, in the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. Now this text and others like it provided inspiration for those who sought to rally support for the Crusades. They were used to justify religious war during the Reformation. They were used to promote the ideology of degeneracy. And that's the ideology that some people are too corrupt in hereditary terms to be permitted to procreate. And as many of you will know, degeneracy theory was the father of the eugenics movement. And these texts were even used to whip up hatred against the Tutsis during the, the Rwandan genocide. This is a picture of skulls stored in a church in Kigali. Just a few of many who were slain in that church building. The murderers were alerted to the people, to the presence of the people, sorry, the murderers were alerted to the presence of the people sheltering there by their own priest. Now the hermeneutics of these texts is a huge and complex subject and beyond the scope of today's lecture, I'm afraid. But the question I would like us to consider is how we read them ethically. Now I've argued in my written paper um, but I'm going to take it as read today, that, it, that these texts are not to be taken normatively. In other words, it should not be automatically assumed that they are intended to describe how things should be. But normative or not, these are texts that do something. You see, some written or spoken texts have a stronger effect than others. In 1955, J.L. Austin delivered a series of lectures which represented a huge move forward in literary theory. These lectures were later published in the now well-known book, How to Do Things with Words, and I'm guessing some people here will be familiar with that book. Austin showed us that some utterances, by, by utterance I mean um, really a, a word that is spoken or written, some utterances have an effect that is deeper 
than their simple propositional content. Let me give you an example. Consider the words, there is a bull in this field. Now, we all understand the essential content of what is being said with that sentence. But the force of what I'm saying will depend on the situation in which I'm speaking. So if you are a prospective purchaser of that bull, and you've come a long distance with cash in hand and can't see the animal in question because it's hiding behind a tree or something, it'll have one force. If you are a group of ramblers who look as if you might not outrun the animal on a 100-metre sprint, it has a different force. And therefore, the effect of any utterance can also vary. It might, in this instance, evoke reassurance or fear. You see, words can do something. And this is known as speech act theory. Now, my argument in this lecture is that texts of violence constitute a speech act. In other words, they do something to the reader. Consider the documents of the Holocaust. It's been argued that they amount to a morally binding statement. Because once we have read them, we are under an ethical obligation to resist such deeds in our own time. Edith Vishagrod has argued this. It makes no difference how recent or remote the events are. Reading about them imposes a responsibility upon the reader. And I'd argue that texts of violence in the Old Testament function in much the same way. Reading them places us under a responsibility. The act of reading them cannot and should not be neutral. But how do we discern the nature of that responsibility? So my questions for us to consider today are these. What, if anything, are these texts doing to us? How are we supposed to respond to them? And what tools can be used to try to find this out? And as a, a partial and incomplete answer to this question, I'm here going to offer five suggested principles to guide us as we consider this question of how we read these texts ethically. I'm under no illusion that this is the final word on the subject. And in my mind, what I'm doing is wanting to um, embark on a conversation and a welcome continuation of that conversation, either in person here or by email or and, and, and among ourselves and so on. So my first suggested principle is this, we, we wrestle. Some of you, but I don't assume all of you, will be familiar with the work of Hans-Georg Gadamer. Arguing pragmatically, Gadamer writes that meaning emerges from a text when its own horizon becomes merged with that of the reader. A horizon, in the term that he's using it, is the standpoint of the reader or writer, which limits their view of reality. And Gadamer says that meaning emerges when I, as a reader, merge my horizon with what the original writer could see and imagine. And this is closely related to the idea of the hermeneutical spiral, where the initial preconceptions of the reader, which is the reader's original horizon, if you like, provide a starting point for making a provisional interpretation of the text. Now, that provisional interpretation goes on to modify the reader's starting point, <coughs> changes their worldview a little bit. And that then permits them to make a new, slightly revised, and hopefully better interpretation. And this is standard hermeneutical theory, and I know will be familiar to many of you. But this idea of the text being in conversation with the reader is fundamental to the work of a scholar named Mikhail Bakhtin. Bakhtin was, uh, had a bit of a sad life, really. He, he grew up in Soviet Russia. And um, for reasons that may become apparent as I explain what he worked on, um, his work was not um, appreciated by the regime in Soviet Russia. And he spent quite a lot of his time in internal exile. And there's a particularly sad story where um, one of his books which he'd written, there were only two copies, it hadn't yet been printed. One copy had gone to the publishers for printing, and one copy was in his possession in internal exile. And the publishers was bombed and that copy was destroyed. And Bakhtin was so miserable that he smoked his way through the only uh, remaining copy. So poor old Bakhtin, much of his work was not published during his lifetime. And many of the scholars who would have been 
interacting with his work if they had only known of it, didn't and couldn't. But in Bact Bactine doesn't wholly agree with Gadamer, because in his analysis, horizons don't become fused, but they remain in dialogue with one another. Bactine identifies dialogue both within texts, and I'm going to talk about that in a little while, and between texts and their readers. For Bactine, meaning is found where voices clash. Let me say that again, because I think it's really significant. Meaning is found where voices clash. This is slightly similar to the work of Wayne Booth, who hasn't read Bactine, but would no doubt have liked to. And he argues that when we read a book, we give ourselves in conversation to its author. Now, I think it'll be obvious that such a conversation may have ethical consequences, indeed a transforming effect. It might shape our opinions, it might shape our character. As Kevin Van Hooser argues, we are a product of what we read. Now, if that's true for normal works of fiction and non-fiction, how much more is that going to be true of our Bibles? The work of the Spirit in biblical interpretation is often overlooked by hermeneutical theorists. If you pick up a book on hermeneutics and turn to the index and look for a reference to the Holy Spirit, you will often be disappointed. We could discuss why that might be, but I'm not going to today. But Karl Barth is certainly one honorable exception to that. His understanding of the Bible becoming the word of God to us as we read it is absolutely based upon the belief that reading the Bible is different from reading any other book because it constitutes an encounter with the divine author. So, if reading is a conversation with the author, and reading the Bible is a conversation with the divine author, where does wrestling fit in? What are our options as we consider the, one of the ethically challenging texts of the Old Testament? Uh, in general discourse on social media and in conversation, I've observed two main approaches. The first approach, which tends to be taken by people of a more conservative bent theologically, is a refusal to acknowledge that there is any difficulty with the text. Now, I find it hard to believe that any of us could be calm or dispassionate if we were standing watching some of the gruesome events we read about in, let's say, Joshua. And so to deny that these texts raise challenging questions seems to me to be dishonest. The second option which I observe, generally among those of a more liberal inclination, is a wholesale rejection of these texts, sometimes of the entire Old Testament. And these voices, I would suggest, have not taken seriously enough the importance of the Old Testament to the New. Third century heretic Marcion appears to be alive and well in parts of the UK church today. Now, when we're faced with a conflict between our beliefs and the evidence that we're presented with, we have a number of options. And psychologically, one of the most appealing ways to deal with that tension is to adopt what is known as, as a comfortable theory. A comfortable theory is one that allows us to maintain our beliefs with the minimum amount of effort. It's a theory which, when we're torn between two different explanations for a problem, is the one that is least challenging for us. It's the path of least resistance, if you like. I think comfortable theories are lazy and dishonest, and I suggest that both of these options can tend towards the use of comfortable theories and cognitive dissonance. So is there a third option? Well, you know I think there is, because I've set it up that way. <laughs> Perhaps the biblical model which can be helpful here is the image of Jacob wrestling with God. I'm sure you're familiar with it. He comes to the ford of Jabbok, he encounters a man who turns out to be God, and he wrestles with him all night. And it's no coincidence that the nation which took its name, which is descended from Jacob, and which took its name from him, did not name itself his given name Jacob, but named itself what he was called after that encounter, which is Israel, he who wrestles with God. Walter Brueggemann argues that wrestling with God is found within the text of the Old Testament itself. 
And he describes this using language of testimony and counter-testimony. Let me give you um, a very simple example of the sort of thing he's talking about. And I'm, I was, as I was reminded, when a, a Proverbs scholar was sitting in my audience in the previous lecture, this is oversimplifying it, but I'm going to do it anyway. The book of Proverbs, by and large, gives you a theology that um, if you live well, you will prosper. If you live righteously, God will bless you. And if you don't, you won't, and he won't. It's not as simple as that, but that's not a bad way of summarizing it. The book of Job looks at the book of Proverbs and goes, yeah, right. That's testimony and counter-testimony. With regard to the texts of male on female violence in the Old Testament, Phyllis Tribble, who's done a lot of work in this area, describes her preferred hermeneutical approach like this. We struggle mightily, only to be wounded, but yet we hold on seeking a blessing, which is, of course, exactly what Jacob did. And I suggest that as we engage with these ethically challenging stories, a more faithful approach than ignoring them or simply asserting that they are fine is to struggle with them, to wrestle with them, and in doing so, to wrestle in conversation with their divine author. But we must beware, because as Jacob shows us, and Job proves, and Van Hooser argues, such a conversation will not leave us unaltered. If we're willing to engage in the wrestling match, we may well leave limping. We might be scarred, we might lose the wrestling match, but that's the deal. And we come to my second suggested principle to guide us as we seek an ethical response to these texts. And this is that we move, if we need to, from an attitude of apathy to one of empathy, or if you like, from indifference to lament. Telling the truth about acts of violence can be a matter of seeking justice, an act of integrity, as this example of investigative journalism from a couple of years ago shows. Or, it can be a prurient, voyeuristic exercise, titillating the reader, often for commercial benefit. In contrast to many of the tabloid newspapers or pulp fiction paperbacks of today, the Old Testament is generally quite sparse in its description of violence. Consider this description of one of the most horrific moments in biblical history, the rape of the Levite's concubine. So the man seized his concubine and put her out to them. They wantonly raped her and abused her all through the night until the morning. And as the dawn began to break, they let her go. As morning appeared, the woman came and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was until it was light. There is no graphic detail. There is no pornography. There is no prurient focus upon the woman's anguish. If this were Game of Thrones, it would be told quite differently. The narrator draws a tender veil over her suffering. It's enough to tell us that she endured it without lingering over the details. It's important, incidentally, that we distinguish between the way that a character is treated within the narrative and the way a character is treated by the narrative. And we'll return to this point later. So I suggest that an ethical reading of these texts will take its cue from the narrator's discreet distance. And why would I feel the need to emphasize that the Bible should not be read pornographically? Well, here is an online computer game for young children. It's tagged by the designer as a, quote, Christ game, unquote. Simple um, Google search will turn this up. And in order to win, a player has to defend the Ark of the Covenant, that's the rather odd-looking thing on the left-hand side, from the evil Midianites. They're the guys in the blue helmets, I think. Uh, which will, of course, involve killing as many of them as possible. Is that okay? I don't think wholesale slaughter should be a source of amusement. Amusement. 
don't think it should be a source of glee. I don't think our preschool or pre, um, our primary age children should be playing these games. There's scientific evidence in adults that deep and prolonged immersion in texts where the deity sanctions killing increases aggression. And if it does that in adults, what does it do in children? Now, I'm not suggesting that we censor the Old Testament, but I do believe we should pay careful attention to how these stories are told and used in our churches. In his prescient book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, Neil Postman argues that some means of communication are inherently unfit for the thoughtful and sensitive ethical discussion of serious matters. Here he's speaking about television news. We are presented not only with fragmented news, but news without context, without consequences, without value, and therefore without essential seriousness. That is to say, news as pure entertainment. And taking his point at its broadest, his book is a sharp critique of the trivialization of the deadly serious. And the danger, I think, is that we may become immune to the violence of the stories we are reading. We may allow them to brutalize us rather than sensitize us. Consider these insouciant words by the eminent biblical archaeologist William Foxwell Albright. Strictly speaking, this Semitic custom of total destruction was no worse, from the humanitarian point of view, than the reciprocal massacres of Protestants and Catholics in the 17th century. It is questionable whether a strictly detached observer would consider it as bad as the starvation of helpless Germany after the armistice in 1918 or the bombing of Rotterdam in 1940. I find his concept of a strictly detached observer rather uncomfortable. More helpful, perhaps, is the advice of Denise Ackerman, who writes this. I suggest that the ancient language of lament offers a vehicle for expressing the raw emotions arising from situations such as Tamar's. We're going to come to that particular passage in a minute. The language of lament also offers the body of Christ the opportunity to say, we are suffering. We stand in solidarity with all who suffer. And we lament while we believe that there is hope for all in the good news. Whatever else these texts do to us, they are describing brutalities that still occur today. And at the very least, they should cause us to lament and to be attentive to modern victims of violence. So we come to my third suggestion. And this is that in, in true London underground style, we must mind the gaps. We should notice what the text is not saying. Who is not speaking and what is not being expressed? Well, what do I mean by this? The philosopher, literary critic and social historian Michel Foucault has described a number of overlapping processes by which discourse is, to use his term, rarefied. And by this, he's referring to the use of power to restrict or control discourse. In actual fact, Foucault views discourse itself as fundamentally an act of violence. That might be pushing things a little bit far for us, but it might be helpful at this point to comment that Foucault sees his work as a descriptive tool for understanding the way that texts function. And it's not necessary to subscribe to his entire system, which leans heavily towards skepticism in order to benefit from his approach. This table shows some of the ways in which Foucault suggests that language can be controlled and manipulated. One of the easiest ways to restrict expression is to exclude individuals from the public discourse. The silencing of women under the Taliban, or not so long ago from suffrage in our own country, would be good examples of this rarefaction. It's by no means always a gender issue, but of course that's a couple of examples that spring readily to mind. So Foucault encourages us to notice the structures and systems of power and control in our texts and to mind the gaps. Is this a helpful way forward? Well, yes and no, I think. The problem is that Foucault hardly needs to get out of bed to show us that the Old Testament is written in a context of male privilege and dominance. 
and that these values can sometimes be found within the text itself. That is clear and I would imagine uncontroversial. But a thoughtful and perhaps deeper application of his ideas can reveal cross currents within the text, which may prove very enlightening. The challenge is to identify the voices that are suppressed by the text and notice the surprising ones that are not suppressed. Allow me to illustrate this with two examples from the so-called texts of terror that I've already referred to. This is a term that Phyllis Tribble coined for five texts of male on female violence in the Hebrew Bible. First, we consider the rape of Tamar. If you've forgotten it or never read it, it's the story of a royal prince raping his half-sister and of her consequent ruin. In this story, Tribble identifies the surprising clarity of the victim's voice as she speaks with dignity and wisdom. No, my brother, do not force me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do anything so vile. As for me, where could I carry my shame? And as for you, you would be as one of the scoundrels in Israel. Now therefore, I beg you, speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. And after the crime, no, my brother, for this wrong in sending me away is greater than the other that you did to me. Now, notice, please, the difference between the treatment of the woman within the narrative and her treatment by the narrative. By her rapist, the woman is violated and ruined. But by the narrator, her memory is retold with compassion and tenderness. Her name is memorialized and her dignity esteemed. We would not want this story airbrushed out. We would protest if this story were airbrushed out because it matters. Even more surprising, I think, is the account of the Levite's concubine in Judges 19. And again, in case anyone's memory needs refreshing, it's the very troubled account, we heard it briefly earlier, of the gang rape, murder and dismemberment of the unnamed concubine of a Levite in the pre-monarchical days of Israel. Now here I differ from Tribble in how I read this story. Because Tribble considers that the narrator has no interest in the victim of the crime, since he neither names her nor dwells on the details of her torture. She says the power struggle between the two men highlights the plight of the woman who brought them together, but whom they and the storyteller ignore. And she says the crime itself receives few words if the storyteller advocates neither pornography nor sensationalism. He also cares little about the woman's fate. My first comment is that Tribble fails to take due account of the fact that no one in this story is named. And this may be a literary device to give the story a more general applicability. This isn't just what happened to one woman, it's the sort of thing that used to happen all the time. But there's a second key point which I think Tribble overlooks. What we need to understand is that the key purpose of the book of Judges is Israel's need for a king. And so the narrator tells us several times, in those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. And I've deliberately left the gender-specific language there. And to that end, we're given a number of, of stories of anarchy and horror which spiral, spiral rapidly in the extremes of their violence. And the climax of these stories is this one and what unfolds as a result. Because when he, and the narrator surely is a he, when he wants to put the final nail in the coffin of Israel's ungodly chaos, he tells us this story of the rape and murder of a nameless woman. Not a man, not even a high-ranking wife, a nameless nobody, a concubine. Judith Butler would put it like this. The concubine's life is grievable. It matters enough to be recorded. It matters enough to be remembered. It matters enough that we are still talking about it today, thousands of years after the text was written. The memorialization of this woman's savage death places her right at the center of societal concern, or at least of our narrator's 
concern. Foucault would no doubt critique the underlying patriarchy of the text, but the use of his technique to analyze the unexpected dynamics within this story show how the text holds her with surprising tenderness. And thirdly, we should note how Foucault's technique can help us to notice the power plays that are at work as we interpret texts. For a long while, scholarly interpretation has largely been the privilege of the white educated male. And rightly, the texts are now falling into the hands of a much wider range of interpretive communities. But let us not imagine that ideological power structures are being demolished by this. Consider the story of the Exodus, widely regarded as being a liberatory text. Of course, it's been adopted in recent decades by liberation theologians as their core narrative for the development of a theology that brings dignity and emancipation to the poor. But the danger is that the removal of one set of power structures may result in their replacement with another set. So let's listen to a Native American theologian commenting on how he views the Exodus stories. The obvious character in the story for Native Americans to identify with are the Canaanites. As a member of the Asaji Nation of American Indians, I read the Exodus story with Canaanite eyes. And it is the Canaanite side of the story which has been overlooked by those seeking to articulate theologies of liberation. These texts belong to nobody, or to everybody. And the danger of their ideological appropriation, no matter how well intended, is that it can prove oppressive to others. So we must mind the gaps, notice the power structures that are at work, both within and without our texts. Now we come to my fourth suggested principle, and that is that we pay attention to the contexts. And I can hear you cry, well, you're teaching granny to suck eggs. But notice that I said contexts in the plural. Of course, reading in context is part of the Bible reading 101 that I hope we all do and teach. But there may be deeper levels of context that we fail to consider sometimes. Here are some suggestions. First, we need to consider the framing of the narrative. Have a look at this picture may be familiar to you. I remember this happening. I remember this exact moment. I was sitting in the lounge with my eldest daughter, who was a toddler, and well, preschool anyway, and I said to her, remember this moment. This is a historic moment, and of course she doesn't, but I remember it. It's the photograph, of course, of the toppling of Saddam Hussein's statue in Feodos Square, Baghdad, at the end of the Iraq War in 2003. And it shows us a large crowd of joyful Iraqis spontaneously pulling down the statue of their hated dictator. This photograph has not been photoshopped or doctored. It's an accurate representation of events. Or is it? This is exactly the same photograph, uncropped. And what do you notice that's different? Well, the crowd is a lot smaller than we might have thought. And we might notice the presence, presence of American tanks parked all the way around the square. This might not have been quite such a spontaneous uprising as the original photograph suggested. It all depends on how the image is framed. Another example um, was a little bit before Christmas. You may remember that President Trump retweeted a Britain First video. Um, actually, he didn't retweet it directly. He retweeted it via somebody else. And they interviewed that somebody else, um, that woman, on the Today program uh, the following morning. And they interviewed her and they said, don't you think it was irresponsible of you to retweet this um, inflammatory video? In fact, it was more than one, I think. And she said, no. And they said, don't you think it's you have responsibility to check your facts before you retweet it? And she said, no. And she said, a video is a video but it isn't. It depends on how it is framed. And her video had been framed in such a way that it deliberately misrepresented actually what had happened. This idea of framing is another insight that we owe to Judith Butler. She was the one who taught us about grievability. And Butler teaches us that we need to pay attention to how images and stories 
are framed, how they are presented and where the boundaries are placed. Because how we respond to the center will depend upon the frame around it. And so if we're going to read Old Testament texts of violence ethically, we should pay attention to the way we present them when we read them in our churches, when we tell them. Because if we don't, we may end up distorting their message. Let me give you an example. This is kind of a timeline. Um, it's timeline of the, of the conquest, the first part of Joshua. Let's consider the story of the stoning, which comes at the bottom of our timeline there. It's from Joshua 7. It's an odd little story, the stoning of Achan, I should say. Uh, a funny little story. A man and his family are executed for looting. What's going on? Were they the only people who looted the conquered city of Jericho? Were they scapegoated? Why is the language of total destruction, or cherem, used of Achan? And if we expand the frame of our reading and, and go back a bit, we'll find in the previous chapter a story which is almost the exact opposite in every way. Rahab, a pagan woman who should have been subject to the cherem order from the total annihilation, She's saved from it by an act of faith in God. These stories should definitely be read together, and neither will make sense unless they are read with the other. But really, we can only understand the conquest of Jericho if we've read back as far as chapter 5, where Joshua meets a man with a drawn sword and has this conversation. Are you for us or our enemies? And in words that ought to astonish us, the man replies, neither, but as commander of the army of the Lord I have now come, neither. So we need to be really careful about where we begin and end our Bible readings in church, where we begin and end the stories we tell. But we also need to consider the contemporary frame or the context in which a story is told or read. So perhaps, for example, there were certain stories that we shouldn't read on Remembrance Day because of the possibility of them being interpreted on that day in a manner that will fuel nationalism or jingoism. Or perhaps there were certain stories in the Old Testament which would be particularly effective to read on that day because of their similarity to modern events or because they subvert uncritical enthusiasm for war-making. That's framing in a nutshell. But there are other contexts which need to be considered as we approach a text. And next we'll consider polyphony, which we touched on very briefly earlier. Mikhail Bakhtin again, remember him? The Russian literary theorist. He speaks of polyphony as the presence of unmerged voices in the text. Voices which disagree, and none of which has a privileged position over the other one. These voices need not be those of characters in a narrative, although they might be. They might also, in our multi-authored Bibles, be the different contributors who have written at different times and in their own particular perspectives, and who do not, let us be honest about this, always see eye to eye with one another. But Bakhtin's work urges us not to be disconcerted by this, because, we recall, for Bakhtin, truth is discerned at the meeting of these voices. They're not to be fused or blended in some sort of compromised middle ground. They should be allowed to speak and play and dialogue. And this is part of the context we need to consider as we approach these difficult texts. So, for example, in 2 Kings 9 and 10, we read of a, an awful, a bloody coup by one Jehu who slaughters the king of Israel and the king of Judah and the entire royal family of the northern kingdom in one awful blood fest. And it may be rather disturbing for us to read that the author of the book of Kings telling him pains to tell us how God is using Jehu to bring about judgment on the house of Ahab for Ahab's actions over poor dead Naboth a few chapters earlier. But if we attend to the polyphonic context we have to notice that in Hosea, the actions of Jehu are subject to God's criticism and judgment. Or, consider the really rather difficult prophecy of Nahum, which is focused entirely on the pagan city of Nineveh and how she will be getting her comeuppance for all her evil and idolatry. But we mustn't read it without remembering the story of Jonah 
where God's tenderness to that same city is revealed. Truth is found at the point where these voices come into dialogue. One should not obliterate the other, but they should be allowed to speak and argue and play. And an ethical reading of these texts will allow them to do just that. And our third context relates to the horizons within which a story is placed. Now, I spoke earlier about the two horizons idea of Gadamer, also of Thistleton, but this is a little bit different. The three horizons of interpretation were described by someone called Edmund Clowney in a book on homiletics on the art of preaching. Now, Clowney's first horizon is familiar, I suspect, to all of us, and that's the textual one. We read a text in the immediate context of, the, of, of the, the, the chapter and the book. And we all know we shouldn't move to any further steps in hermeneutics until we performed a thorough and rigorous exegesis of the text itself in its own context. But after this lie two theological horizons, but they're different from one another, and they need to be performed in order. First, there is the epochal horizon. Simply put, where are we in the story so far? And at this point, we're not supposed to remember anything that comes later. Now, this can be a challenge with texts which were not necessarily written in the order of the events they narrate, but we do our best. And certainly, the New Testament is inadmissible when we are considering the epochal horizon of any Old Testament text. I was teaching a course on biblical theology um, to a group of students, and I was making this point um, all week to them. And from time to time, we'd turn up an Old Testament text, and I'd say, what's this about? And they'd say something about Jesus, and I'd say, no, no, not yet, not yet. What does it mean here? And all week, I kept saying it to them. And we got to the last day, and I did it again, and I turned to an Old Testament text. I said, what's this about? And I could see them opening their mouths to say the same thing. And I said, Jesus is never the answer. <laughs> And they said, can we tweet that? And I said, no. <laughs> it's all about the context. <laughs> so our third horizon, only once we've done the first two steps, we may bring in the canonical horizon. We can consider that narrative within the whole testimony of Scripture. Now, within this canonical consideration of the text, this whole Bible consideration of the text, I'd like to suggest that there are three points of privilege Three points where we get a glimpse of what is supposed to be normative. First of all, there is the Garden of Eden before the fall. Here we see a non-competitive relationship between the man and the woman, who have been placed in the garden by a God who has created the world out of love and with no violence, in stark distinction to the other ancient Near Eastern creation stories. And at the opposite end to this creational point of privilege is the one found at the other end of the story, where the tree of life is offered for the healing of the nations, and where the exclusion of murderers shows that life in the New Jerusalem is an intrinsically non-violent existence. And the third point of privilege, of course, is that supreme moment of revelation where God himself comes and dwells among us, all of the other points in the story, I suggest, carry a sense of contingency, of God's people trying to live ethically in an unethical, broken world and always failing to a greater or lesser extent. I visualize it like this. There are three points in history which give us a sort of ethical fix, one at the beginning, one at the end, and one in the middle. And they form a sort of triple tether on the buzzing timeline of history. And every other narrative is just an approximation of how life should be lived. Now, in my written version of this, I have written about some caveats around our ability to interpret these points of privilege, inasmuch as they're narrated and interpreted in a fallen world and within a particular Sitzim Laban life context. So if you feel I've been a little bit sweeping there, then please read the written paper before you email me about it. But what all this amounts to, of course, is a plea to do biblical theology and to do it well. Christ is the final interpreter of the Old Testament texts. His cross is the final demonstration of the death of death, of the obliteration of violence, of the eclipse of evil. But we will not understand that interpretation of the texts at all if we do not first pay attention to them in their pre-Christ context. 
Nonetheless, biblical theology, which is an attempt to understand the developing theology throughout the whole of the Bible, is dependent, in my opinion, upon the faith commitment that these diverse texts demonstrate coherence. Not uniformity, not total agreement, as I've said, but that they testify to the same God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We can't do biblical theology unless we start at that point. One example of good biblical theology is offered by Tremper Longman, who shows how the biblical view of warfare develops as the story unfolds. So to begin with, God fights against the flesh and blood enemies of his people, and most of our problematic texts are located in that part of the Bible. Later on, God fights against Israel. Well, who saw that coming? Then the battlegrounds are partially redrawn eschatologically. Then Jesus Christ is revealed as the divine warrior who conquers not through violence, but through self-sacrifice. And finally, Jesus Christ is revealed as the eschatological, the end times warrior, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And so finally, we come to the fifth principle for reading texts of violence ethically. And this is that we attend to the power of remembering and to the power of forgetting. This is a picture of soldiers being evacuated from the beach at Dunkirk by a little flotilla of requisitioned pleasure craft. And this is London on VE Day. Perhaps these two pictures represent how we choose to remember Britain's part in World War II. Doughty little Britain, who held on against impossible odds, stood alone against the evil of the Axis powers and snatched victory from the jaws of defeat. Perhaps this image doesn't come quite so readily to our minds. This is a picture taken after the British firebombing of Dresden, when the incendiary devices were so close and the fires so intense that people within the zone died of suffocation through the oxygen consumption of the flames. Perhaps this isn't the part of the story we routinely tell ourselves. History telling, John Van Seters tells us, is a society rendering account to itself, explaining who it is and how it got there. History telling takes place through rituals and habits and memorials and through official and unofficial storytelling. In other words, every time we tell a story concerning past events, we are being amateur historians. Every time we select this part of the big story for inclusion or that part for omission, we are constructing a history. And history telling is an ethical enterprise. Edith Vishagrod, again, she says, history telling is not just making something transparent. It is a declaration of what is and what ought not to have been. Or similarly, Svetan Todorov says, the work of the historian never considers solely in establishing the facts, but also in choosing certain among them as being more salient and more significant than others, then placing them in relation to one another. So history making can be used or abused. And along with this then, memory can be used or abused, and forgetting can be constructive or abusive. Paul Ricoeur stresses to us the importance of actively remembering for two particular reasons. First, because remembrance of the victim negates the celebration of the victor, and second, because remembrance can be a means of forgiveness and reconciliation. On the other hand, remembering can be an unhealthy thing perpetuating cultural memories of victimhood and transmitting them generationally. I'd suggest that some of the marches and counter-marches in Ulster fall into this category, as memories of events that are hundreds of years old are transmitted in live form to the next generation. Another danger of remembering is the establishment within a cultural mindset of what are known as narrative templates. Those are biscuits. That disturbs me. <laughs> narrative templates are recurring patterns within national or cultural history which become normative for that society, sort of self-fulfilling prophecies. These often become ethnocentrically particular, and they can limit imaginative possibilities of new ways of being. 
On the other hand, forgetting can be an ethically positive act. After all, we celebrate the fact that God chooses to remember our sins no more. But especially when forgetting is enforced, it can be an oppressive act. Constructive remembering and constructive forgetting were both seen in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission following the end of apartheid in South Africa, where violent and abusive actions were named and described and confessed. And then there was a deliberate decision to remember them no more. So what does it mean to remember well as we consider the stories from the Bible that we tell and the way that we tell them and the histories that we're constructing as we do so? A few comments. First, let's be attentive to the histories that we are constructing. A narrowly ethnocentric view of Israel, for example, is not sustained by the wider text of the Old Testament, where no nation is above reproach, and where unexpected people find themselves included in the people of God. Second, we should take care not to allow these stories to become narrative templates that form unhealthy patterns of personal or community behavior, and which limit the imagination of alternative possibilities. In particular, we might consider the narrative template that seems to provide a framework for the conquest and occupation of parts of Palestine by modern Israel. It's important that we think carefully about the theological relationship between the modern state of Israel and the ancient nation by the same name, and that we don't uncritically equate the two. Thirdly, we should weigh up the relative merits of remembering and forgetting the victims of these texts. In order for life to go on after a great evil, amnesia is sometimes necessary. But what of situations where life has gone on for thousands of years? Does the risk to peace still trump the imperative to remember? And it seems to me that with these ancient wrongs, the need for reconciliation and healing has largely lapsed, whereas the consequence of forgetting the victim continues to be very costly. The routine omission of the texts of sexual violence from our Sunday services, for example, means that their crimes and their victims are still being obliterated from memory and excluded from discourse. In pastoral terms, this might represent a missed opportunity for remembering and honoring such victims, ancient and modern. Setting these narratives free in our congregations may allow them to have a voice and give words to their lament. So in conclusion, there are some serious outstanding theological questions about many of the Old Testament texts of violence, particularly those where God appears to command violent action. And this lecture has contributed little, if anything, to that debate. But I hope it has served as a call to take these texts very seriously and to read them ethically, using every tool that we have. We need to decide whether we will ignore these stories and so silence the victims and allow people in our churches to stumble across them unprepared, or whether we will grasp the nettle, wrestle with them faithfully and honestly, without cognitive dissonance, and train the people in our churches to do the same. We need to decide whether we will allow these texts to brutalize us and our children, or whether we will let them sensitize us to the plight of the abused and the violated. We need to decide whether we will stand with the powerful and violent, or whether we will notice the systems of power at work within the ancient world and still today, and attend to the unheard voices within our own society and give them expression. We need to decide whether we will read thinly and narrowly, or whether we will learn to identify the ways that the authors and the divine author are inviting us to read more richly. We need to decide whether we will allow these stories to become normative in our understanding, or whether we will read them as part of that great story that extends from creational shalom to eternal shalom, in which we are beckoned to live as though the reign of the Prince of Peace were already here. And with all God's people, we will long and work for the day when violence is no more, and we will pray, come Lord Jesus.
Thank you. Well, on your behalf, I want to express a real thanks to Helen for what was a fascinating uh, lecture in so many ways, really full of interest that makes me want to, to read those texts again, uh, but to read them very carefully and critically with uh, eyes open to so many of the dynamics that we easily miss. So thank you, thank you. so much for that, for that lecture today. Really good. Um, don't forget, if you want to get the added detail, you can... Uh, get the, the booklet over there later. Uh, we've got a short time for some questions and interaction uh, with Helen, whether you agree or disagree or want clarification. Uh, we're going to pass a microphone around so that we can uh, pick these up for the recording. So if you'll just be patient, uh, if you want to ask a question or make a comment and put your hand up, uh, I'll try and spot your hand and get the microphone to you. Great. I'm interested. I'm interested to tell him about the we and how we discern. Um, because for me, um, how communities of people discern the text is very important. And most books about homiletics are very individualistic. And like reading the New Testament through the eyes of black Americans has been very helpful to me. Or uh, some of the people who have suffered as refugees coming and looking at biblical texts here in Glasgow and the way in which they read the text is distinct from the way in which I would read it, but I find that gives me a further insight. So how we discern seems to be a very important, if that becomes a community discernment or even a particularly racial or gender perspective. Oh, I absolutely agree. And the we could get ever, ever wider, couldn't we? It's, it's good to listen to voices from people we never even meet as well and, and expand that we, so I wholly agree. This, this may be an unfair question. Um, have you come across Greg Boyd's recent work, The Death of the Warrior God? <laughs> um, I've just waded through all 1,400 pages of it. Um, it. It seems to me rather special in that, one, he's trying to take a conservative approach to scripture, and two, he's writing from the point of view of a convinced pacifist. But uh, are you, if you've read it, are you convinced by his arguments and would you like to comment? Uh, I'm afraid I haven't. It's sitting on my... I got it for Christmas and it's still waiting to be read. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to comment, I'm afraid. Sorry. I have read, um, recently read John Walton's book, um, The Lost World of the Israelite Conquest. And that is very striking. And uh, for the people who want to think a bit more about these issues, not what I've been talking about particularly, but these texts, um, I would commend that book, certainly. Helen, you said um, to wrestle without cognitive dissonance. Now, can you please unpack that? Because do you mean to wrestle with it until the dissonance goes, to close the gap between what we believe and what we are faced with? Can you unpack that a bit more, please? I, I think it's, it's about, I was used the expression earlier, chewing it till the meat, till the juice is run, or, or, or telling God I'm not happy with it and keep asking the question and keep thinking about it and keep reading and keep talking and keep coming back to it and keep praying until the day that this, that light breaks out of it, I think. I think it's about that. It's about this, it talked about the hermeneutical spiral, it's about coming back around and, you know, never sitting in judgment over scripture, um, but not being afraid to say, do you know what, Lord, I don't like this. I don't understand this. What's going on here? What is that about? That's kind of sums up my life, actually, I think. <laughs> That's what it feels like to me. Okay, <clears throat> this is a question from a complete layman in this matter. I think you've already said there's not an absolute answer to this question. But um, the question that's always troubled me is uh, the section in the Old Testament, or the sections where God commands the uh, obliteration of people and all that violence. Um, do you think that there are uh, uh, implications if we say that God didn't really do that, that it was actually the Israelites rewriting history to uh, appease themselves? Do you, th what, do you think there are drastic implications if we take that approach? 
It's such a big question that I'm really loath to try and answer it in a minute or two. Um, I don't think we're at liberty to say, I don't like it, so it didn't happen. I don't think that's an acceptable way. I think it's fine to say, I don't like it, so what's going on here? What does it mean? But I don't think we're at liberty to say, this doesn't suit me, so I'm going to say it didn't happen. I do think we are absolutely more than at liberty. We, it, we are under a compulsion to read these texts as well as we can. Um, and that means asking what the text is really asserting and what so sometimes this idea of speech act that I've talked about a little bit, sometimes the voice of the text comes a little bit lower than the surface meaning. So one of the questions I am asking, and this isn't a formed opinion, this is something I'm continuing to think about, um, is whether un lying, underlying some of these texts, we hear a different message. Um, so I think potentially, if we do what you just described um, badly, and arrogantly, I think there's a huge cost because we are doing what I said, which is dismissing parts of scripture. I think to wrestle with them and say, what are they really saying? And what, what, where is God's voice in this? Is a valid question, but we need to be careful and prayerful and faithful as we do so. And that is a short answer to something I'm, I'm writing. Can I just say something about, I'm writing a book at the moment um, for BRF, Bible Reading Fellowship. So it's aimed at people in the churches to consider these questions. It will not solve the issues, but it will open up some of them, perhaps. So um, for people who are interested, kind of keep an eye open. It'll be out next year. Helen, uh, thank you, firstly, for a very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, some uh, thoughtful uh, things there to consider. I'm just uh, curious, uh, the very first uh, question you uh, had uh, when you had that telephone call um, for what is a very complex, perhaps a complex subject. Do you now have an easy answer to that question? <laughs> because we might have a similar question uh, to answer ourselves. Indeed. No, I don't have an easy answer. Um, what, I think the, if I had to answer in a sentence, which of course I would never want to do, I'd want to be saying, let's meet, let's pray together, let's open these texts up together. But if I had to answer in one sentence, I would say the fullest, and f at the fullest revelation of God is found in Jesus Christ on the cross. And that is my starting point for anything else I understand. Um, so so I, would, I wouldn't say to this young person, don't read them. I wouldn't say don't wrestle with them. I would say don't lose sight of this revelation of what God is like as we meet him on the cross. Um, have we to look for Jesus I've always been taught that we have, all through the whole Bible, Jesus said, all the scriptures speak of me. I mean, maybe I picked you up wrongly, but when you said to your students and they wanted to see Christ, and you said, can you sort of elaborate a little bit? Um, yes. I would... Um let me, if you haven't read it, can I suggest you read Gordon Fee's How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, because it's a really good book on how to read the Bible. Um, absolutely, all of scripture is straining towards um, Jesus. Um, the Old Testament is full of themes and stories, which are, I, I see them as a bit like streams. They run, run sometimes wide and clear, and then sometimes kind of disappear underground for a while, and then re-emerge. And all of these streams, these big themes, themes like um, land, themes like rest, themes like temple, presence of God, all of these themes are running their way through the Bible, through the Old Testament, and they all meet at Jesus. So yes, the, test, the, the, new, the Old Testament strains towards Jesus at, at, all the way through. But, but I think um, the, the individual authors didn't necessarily have a clear idea of what they were straining towards. They just knew they needed, for example, a good king. Well, we keep getting these series of really lousy kings who take us away from God and don't govern justly. And, oh, that we had a good king. Now, that is straining towards Jesus, but before we see the answer, we need to see how that straining and, 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 um, and, and passion and, and, and urgency is developing. And then when we meet Jesus, actually, he's, he's bigger and better than we realize because we have set up this series of problems and themes and issues, and we suddenly discover that here he is, the, the, the answer to them. So I think it's, it's even better 
than perhaps a, a slightly more um, flat reading, which is perhaps a term I shouldn't have introduced because I'm not going to explain it. Gordon Fee is really good on the subject. That's a really excellent lecture. Um, at, at the end, your, your, your very powerful closing peroration um, w was about the end of violence. Um, and you, know, you, you took us to the, the, the last chapter of the scriptures and the murderers being outside the city. Of course, they're not the only ones Indeed. outside the city. Um, there are idolaters and sorcerers and those who practice falsehood and sexually immoral and so on. Um, I, I, and I guess w w what I'm interested to know is, uh, did, did, did you land on violence there just because you happen to be talking about violence? Or, or do you somehow see violence as um, the, the primal form of human sin or the essence of human sin? I, I chose to refer to murderers because I was talking about violence. Um, I think there is something quite primal about violence. Um, and I think both the Bible, for example, in the immediate consequence of the fall being Cain killing his brother and, and so on, I think the Bible does kind of set that up. And I think also that um, modern anthropologists and social historians show us that quite, quite firmly. But, but that perhaps wasn't what I was necessarily thinking of at the time. Thanks very much, Helen. One of the things that your lecture made me think of is the experience of less and less biblical literacy that we experience in our churches, let alone fluency, which, which is another question altogether. And it's often a problem, isn't it? But it struck me, and maybe again it's going back to the question of that young person who's reading the Bible, presumably kind of afresh, whether there is a gift of sorts there when people don't have already a very formed picture of how the Bible should be read, that these disturbing texts, disturbing as they are, somehow help us to ask genuine questions that perhaps we don't when we know the Bible. It just made me think of that, mm. that makes sense, but yes. I wonder how you would respond to that. Yeah, I think there's something terribly exciting, isn't there, as, as ministers or, or just friends sometimes, reading the Bible with somebody who doesn't know how the story turns out. Um, I was fortunate enough, I was teaching a Hebrew class um, to university students, who, most of whom weren't Christians, and we were translating Samson together, and they didn't know what was going to happen. <laughs> and it was really exciting, because we were doing it very slowly, because we were doing it in Hebrew. So yes, there is. Um, yeah. and and. I don't know what more to enlarge, but I agree. I don't know what more to add, but I agree. Sorry. Hi, Helen. Hi. Thanks. That was a, a great lecture, very stimulating. And I was thinking about the voice of the victim as being a, a motif, I think, that we're seeing more and more in the news, um, Me Too campaigns, Black Lives Matter. Uh, but I wondered, how do we uh, listen well to the voice of the victim um, and I guess redress the balance. I suppose there can be a, a concern with Black Lives Matter that actually the voice of the victim, those who have been victimized, have then turned into violence. Um, and there can be concerns that there's a, a, almost a victor's justice. So how do we listen well to the voice of the, the victim and yet not go to the other extreme of, uh, of becoming victimized because of that? That's a practical question. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, I think there is something about noticing the power dynamics that we play even when we think we're doing something good. Um, and I think there is... Yeah, I mean, th there are many ways to do it. I think we will never listen to the voice of the victim unless we meet them, unless we live with them, unless we encounter them and hear their stories. But I'm not talking about tourism either, you know, um, which is a danger. Um, I think there is, and this is only a partial answer because of, by nature of who will be there, but I think the, the communion table is a place where we are all equal and where all power um, structures should be absent. And I think that is a very powerful place to hear one another. But as I say, 
not everybody's there, so that's only a partial answer. Can I squeeze a question? Because uh, in terms of biblical theology, what you're talking about, biblical theology, and what you started, what you started with in talking about when we immerse ourselves in certain styles of literature, of violence, we become almost anaesthetized, somewhat to the violence. And I'm thinking about the fact that a lot of these texts, like the fall of Jericho and things, are, are Sunday school texts. That's where we hear them. We hardly ever hear them preached, but we get them loads and loads in Sunday school. And you, you also mentioned about uh, we, we become uh, almost blasé about the idea that God is tied up with violence. Has that affected uh, the way that we think about the cross and, you know, our, the... the um, the liking of penal substitution. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's such a big question. I kind of don't know where to answer to answer without without sounding like a, a um, without stereotyping myself, one way or another. I believe in penal substitution. I don't think it's the only thing that the Bible tells us about the cross. I think that violence is inherent at the cross. Um, and I also believe in um, that God judges evil. And I believe that judgment of evil is a good thing um, because otherwise evil would continue and would reign. Um, and so at the cross, I see the judgment of evil um, and I see that that is violent. Um, so I would, I, I believe in penal substitution, I defend it, but as I say, I think sometimes we see that as the only way of understanding the cross, and I don't think it is. I think there are lots of others as well. And I'm not going to say any more about that subject. <laughs> Ellen, you used the example at one stage in your lecture of the, the TV news scenario, and <clears throat> suppose in our generation, with the proliferation of rolling news and the internet and 24 7 coverage, we almost have a conveyor belt of victims portrayed before us. And occasionally there come these totemic moments, 9-11, where victimhood is writ large, Baby Island on the beach, which we've almost forgotten about, Stephen Lawrence back in the news to mark 25 years. How much of these significant, though tragic moments are or should be an open goal for us in church life to visit or perhaps revisit some of these biblical examples of victimhood? I, I, yes, I mean, victimhood and violence are an unsolved problem at present and continue in our society. And I think I, I mentioned in passing that we wouldn't want these our Bibles not to account, recount these stories. We wouldn't want them airbrushed out. We would be indignant if they were airbrushed out of our news. If you know the murder of Stephen Lawrence weren't reported, we were, and we found out about it, we would be furious. So I think the fact that our the, this sacred text of ours talks about these stories is is very important and very precious. Um, and yes, I think there needs to be an ongoing dialogue um, between what is happening now and what happened then and, and, and where God is in all of that. So, yes, I, I think I agree. Uh, these stories are the sort of things that Richard Dawkins has a lot to say about. And I was wondering here, what would he think in relation to the way you've kind of held them in tension? And I started thinking about particularly the demise of Jezebel which is very categorically in King said to be a really good thing, three cheers for Jehu because he's doing God's will. Hosea is absolutely categorically in the opposite direction. Not only is this regrettable, but it's definitely not God's will. And Hosea comes across almost as a kind of pacifist uh, throughout everything we know about his life. So what would you say to Richard Dawkins who would say, I think, the Bible is clearly full of contradictions, doesn't know what it's talking about, and that particular story proves it. What would I say to Richard Dawkins? I don't think that anything I said would be of interest to him, to be honest. Um, I, I think that... I, I, I can't 
There's nothing I could say that would persuade him. It's because he needs to meet Jesus. Um, so I, I don't think I have a good answer to that question because I don't think I have a killer, you know, here you are, prove it, you know, 1 Kings 9 verse 3 proves it. There isn't anything like that, as you know. Um, so I wouldn't be wanting to get into discussion with him about this. I'm not an apologist in that sense, a public apologist in that sense. So that's not my calling, and I would probably do it very badly. Um, but what I would say to the, faith, the people who are listening to him and the people who are struggling with their faith because of him is the sort of thing I've said today and the sort of thing I'm, I'm writing about um, and saying, meet God in Jesus, and then you will understand what matters most and you can work out the rest bit by bit. But I know that that, I know that, that wouldn't satisfy Dr. Dawkins. Have yes, have you? Well, I meet people who say that sort of thing, which is, uh, I mean, they can't both be right, can they? Well, I, I disagree for the reasons that I said. <laughs> Just to follow on from um, another question that's already been asked, I know you mentioned that you're writing a book about helping churches to engage with these questions. And um, Ian asked you about, or mentioned, um, Sunday schools being the only place where we really have, are really taught these stories. Do you think it's appropriate for them to be taught with just for kids and not for adults? I mean, I, I last year I preached in a church on the rape of Tamar because I knew it was a, not my church, but I knew it was a church that could handle it and were, would have been, I would have been forgiven if it wasn't appropriate. Um, but it's not normal. And um, so I just wonder, should that switch be happening where instead of the kids being taught, the adults are engaging with it? I just wonder what you think. I think absolutely these texts should be part of the diet for the adult congregation, absolutely. How we'd handle them with our children is a, is, a, is a matter for care and subtlety, and I'm not saying we don't, but we need to do it carefully and well and not in a jingoistic sort of way, in my opinion. And I think we need to do it as part of a big story. Um, so maybe, yeah, we, we tell the story of, of the, the Battle of Jericho, but actually we see that later on Israel itself loses the land, you know, and, and so on. So we kind of, we see this big picture and, and our youngsters start to fit it together as part of this big picture. No, no. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, our, our congregations, we need to not be just on milk the whole time, don't we? We need to be prepared to feed on meat. Um, so I'm making a little bit of a comment. Uh, you know, John Drain was saying about Richard Dawkins, and I remember just hearing, I think it might have been on Premier Radio, because uh, I lived in London for a while. Uh, I mean, Richard Dawkins is, I think, even... So technically, he's he's uh, obviously an atheist. Uh, he doesn't, but, but he's he, he he, you know, if he was here, he might be willing to describe himself as a cultural Christian. So he he doesn't see any harm in reading the text of Scripture, and obviously the, he doesn't have the Holy Spirit to to enlighten him. Um, you know, and I mean, I'm just somebody who you know, it is inevitable that, that, that you know that there is violence in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And, you know, because we have uh, God's Spirit guiding us, hopefully, then we are led to the cross again, hopefully. You know, so, I, but I, and I think it is, um, you know, and, and we need to persevere with people who, I mean, I, rem I remember when I was in a church in London and there was a lady who, I can't remember if I was visiting her, that, oh, there's an awful lot of blood in the Old Testament, but then, you know, the, even the, the very word, you know, if you don't get a handle on that, then you're, you're going to miss, miss the point, you know. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree that we need to sit with people and be patient with people. And next month, um, we're going to baptise in my church a 93-year-old lady who has wrestled with these questions for a long time, but has finally be prepared to say, well, I don't get it all, but, you know, I'll follow anyway. So, yeah. I haven't been journeying with her for 93 years, incidentally. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for a great lecture. Um, I, I'm interested in, you, in sort of the, the, the pastoral application of this. You as a scholar and a pastor, 
And I'm wondering particularly if you think there are kind of, there's healing potential in this approach. I take Rebecca's point that we often hear these stories via your know, children's teaching, but when we do preach about these or read these texts in church, very often think we, we feel we need to put lots of caveats beforehand. This, this could be very disturbing for some people here. We're aware that people in the congregation might, may well have been victims of violence. And I'm just wondering if you have this kind of, some kind of, you know, if, if you see a kind of healing vision in this or a way of uh, these texts can be read. In I, a... I do, particularly with the, the texts of interpersonal violence, I think. Um, so things like the Levites, Concubine, Rape of Tamar and so on. I think they do. I think they provide expression for uh, people who've carried things secretly for many, many years and, and perhaps a shame that they carry. And to hear that expressed and, and dignified and valued in Scripture, I think can be immensely healing. And, and I, I'm still working out what that means practically, and I'm sure that it looks different in every church in any case. Um, but I do believe that they can be healing when they're used carefully and, and sensitively. Helen mentioned about airbrushing a few times, and in particular, a particular reference to the rape of the con and murdering of the concubine. And uh, he said that if the author had airbrushed that, that actually it wouldn't have given dignity to the victim, but rather by mentioning it, gave dignity to the victim. So my, my question is coming from a personal conviction that actually the church airbrushes its own um, hand in the oppression of, of some people groups. So I think of our reflection of the 20th century, the church's reflection of the 20th century of, you know, we look at the oppression of women and we look at the oppression of the Jews and we, we start to see ourselves as part of that, but rather we airbrush out maybe our part in the oppression of lesbian, gay and bisexual people. So actually, how do we start a period of self-reflection within the church that actually identifies our part in the dehumanization of people and, uh, in the lack, and given the lack of dignity to victims? It's a great question, and I don't know if I have a, a good answer. I think there is something um, I think that that idea of the histories we tell and the way we tell them, um, I think we need to pay attention to the histories we tell. And, and I was talking specifically with regard to the ancient histories, but I think with regard to our modern histories as well. Um, yeah, I think we need to be really honest. And I think we need to stop speaking generally. Uh, this doesn't apply to everybody, of course. But I think sometimes we, we feel this need to present ourselves in a very positive light because that will reflect well on God and on the gospel. Um, and, and as a result, we are dishonest and, and I'm, I'm not into that, which is why I want to wrestle really honestly with these because I'm not into saying it doesn't matter, I'm gonna, it's fine. I, I'm not prepared to stand up and preach to my congregation and say this is fine. I want to say let's, let's chew this till the, meat, the juice is run and, and I want to be honest and I really believe in honesty, so I, yeah, I don't know how we do it, but I agree. Thank you, Helen. Um, that's probably last question. That's okay. It's more a comment than a question, so maybe it's an appropriate place to finish. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Um, it was my church that Rebecca preached at, and your sermon was appreciated. I promise you. Um, prompted some good conversations. Um, you talked early on about Jacob wrestling with God and. One of the sermons I have preached many times is that I and we limp along with God. And I think that's the message that I'm taking away today, that we wrestle with these difficult texts and they do change us and we're left with a limp. We're not as strong and self-sufficient as we thought we were, but by God's grace, we continue to do so. So it's just a, a comment really and thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. I know we're running out of time. Just a general question. What, what you are uh, advocating and inspiring in us is a desire for deep reading, which has a long, a long tradition in the church over the centuries. Uh, now, can you give us just a kind of closing comment on today's culture and the blogospheres that we're moving between, whether the call to deep reading is more subversive than it's ever been, and the dangers and perhaps limitations of the blogosphere, where that fits in with the desire for a quick, short, short answer. 
Yes. Ask without a postcard, please. Yes. <laughs> I, I think you're right. I think we need to do deep reading of scripture and we need to do deep reading of society. And I don't think we're very good at either. And I think part of, somebody referred earlier to rolling news and I think that that mitigates against deep reading because we react instantly to something that we don't yet understand. Um, so yes, I want to say let's read our sacred text deeply and passionately. And let's read society deeply and passionately. And let's bring them into dialogue and let the sparks fly in a good way. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Helen. Can I just mention Yes, something? yes, of course thank you, you. Yes. Um, Just to say that at Bristol Baptist College, we are hopefully um, going to be opening a centre for the study of violent, Bible and violence in the next year or so. Um, so and it's going to be for postgraduate study um, in the first instance. So if by any chance anyone here might be interested in that, um, if you want to kind of jot your name down over there, then I, I would be in touch with you when that happens, if it happens. Thank you. And, the, and your book? Oh, I've mentioned my book, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's cool. Very good. Thanks, thanks for sharing that with us, and thank you, everybody, for, for the questions. I think you've sent us away wanting to, to wrestle with this uh, so much more and to do some of that deep reading. So we're so glad that you've come to Scotland today. Thank you, Helen. And uh, hope you'll come again sometime. <laughs> That's great. Maybe we can thank Helen. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> if you had a burning question and were just too nervous to ask it in public, I think Helen will be around just over by the books there uh, for about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, before we whisk her off to the airport, so there's a chance just to, to say hello to catch her there. So thanks for coming. Uh, see you again sometime. <laughs>